Good afternoon, my name is Ed Crane. I'm president of the Cato Institute and I'm delighted that you're here to share what should be a fascinating event. I've been looking forward to it uh, for uh, some time. Uh, we're going to have a, sure enough, formal debate on uh, should we welcome a libertarian uh, future? And uh, I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, in any event, uh, so often uh, uh, debates in uh, Washington are uh, not really debates. People are starting from totally different premises. Um, today we have four individuals who are four of the sharpest uh, policy minds in town. And all four of them come from basically a liberal perspective in terms of the framework of their analysis, liberal and in a classical sense. So I think there's common goals that they share, and yet they do come to some uh, starkly different policy prescriptions. Not always, but in many instances. So it should be a lively and uh, enlightening uh, debate that I'm looking forward to. The uh, format will be for each of the uh, panelists to speak for eight minutes. Uh, we're going to start with the pro-libertarian side and then have the side that's somewhat skeptical of that perspective. Um, and then, uh, in the same order, we'll have uh, three-minute rejoinders. And then I will ask the panelists, if they like, uh, to ask a question of each other, at which point we'll throw it open to the audience. And then there will be a reception afterwards. So with that, let me uh, introduce our speakers two at a time, I think. Uh, first uh, speaker will be David Bowes, who is Executive Vice President of the Cato Institute. He's been here at Cato longer than anyone other than yours truly, and plays a critical role in all of the policy output uh, that Cato has. He's the author or editor uh, of several books. Of course, the most recent uh, is Libertarianism of Krimmer from Free Press, and also The Libertarian Reader from uh, Free Press. Mm -hmm. um, and joining him on the libertarian side is Charles Murray, my old fishing buddy, who is the Bradley Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, the author of several books, Losing Ground, which I think was uh, one, of, one of those uh, classic paradigm-shifting books in terms of uh, the way people look at welfare uh, today. Uh, in Pursuit of uh, Happiness and Good Government, which I think is a great, great book, and, and The Bell Curve. So we're delighted to have uh, these two individuals supporting the, the libertarian position in this debate today. And we'll start with David Bowes. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, we have tried many forms of coercive government in the 20th century, from communism and fascism and apartheid to the interventionist welfare states of the West, and the results have been unsatisfying. Uh, Americans sense today that the New Deal Great Society paradigm has failed to bring about peace, prosperity, and social harmony, but I think they're not yet convinced that there is a feasible alternative. Uh, many people have observed the problems that, that I would argue have been created by excessive government and have come up with what I would consider some odd solutions. A classic in that line of thinking was the book The Affluent Society by John Kenneth Galbraith. Back around 1960, Galbraith observed what he called private opulence and public squalor. Uh, that is, he said, uh, he saw a society in which privately owned resources were generally clean, well-maintained, safe, and constantly improving in quality, and in which publicly owned resources were generally overcrowded, dangerous, uh, dirty, and deteriorating. And his conclusion was that we ought to move more of society's resources into the public sector. Uh, libertarians offer a different answer, one that I think is more likely to bring about the peace, prosperity, and social harmony that Americans are searching for. That answer is a society of free and responsible individuals living in a constitutional republic in which government's powers are few and defined. In a libertarian world, adult individuals would have the right and the responsibility to make the important decisions about their lives, decisions that too often are seized, arrogated by government. Libertarians believe that people should be free to live their lives as they choose. 
But that is not to defend the sort of atomistic individualism that all of your professors love to derive when you were in college. How one could be an atomistic individual in a complex modern society is beyond me. Uh, would that mean wearing only what you can make, eating only what you grow, uh, living in the house that you build for yourself? Um, some critics of capitalism or advocates of back to nature, like the Unabomber or Al Gore, if he really believes what he wrote in his book, um, might endorse such a plan. But I don't know any libertarian who would want to renounce the benefits of what Adam Smith called the Great Society, the complex and productive society made possible by social interaction. The key issue that divides libertarians from statists all across the political spectrum is not community versus individualism, as a lot of people would tell you today. It is consent versus coercion. Libertarians insist that individuals have the right to choose the kinds of associations they will make with others. And those associations take myriad forms, families, churches, clubs, communities, neighborhood associations, mutual aid associations, and all the institutions of commercial society, partnerships and corporations and unions and so on. The key issue is not whether we will be associated with others in many ways. Of course we will. The issue is whether our participation will be voluntarily chosen. Libertarianism is a philosophy of politics. It does not tell us how we should treat our families, how we should run our businesses, or how we should worship. It says merely, but importantly, that individuals have rights and that society works better when those rights are recognized. The political system envisioned by libertarians is very much the one outlined by James Madison a government of delegated, enumerated, and thus limited powers, ideally limited to government's basic function of protecting our life, liberty, and property, and thus ensuring our ability to make our own decisions and cooperate with others in civil society. And yet today, the federal government spends over $1.5 trillion of our money every year and says that we should sacrifice more. Um, in 1950, the average family paid only 2% of its income to the federal government. Today, the average family pays 25% of its income. Democratic governments today presume to regulate more aspects of our lives more closely than the autocratic regimes of the ancien, uh, automatic, autocratic governments of the ancien regime ever did. Governments in the United States assign our children to schools and choose the books they will read. Uh, require us to report our economic <laughs> transactions to the government, uh, deny terminally ill patients uh, access to pain relieving and life saving <laughs> drugs, and prescribe the number and gender ratio of toilets in buildings open to the public. Um, from the grand scale to the petty scale, a, a, a network of regulations affecting every aspect of life. And although it rarely comes to this in civilized modern societies, it should be remembered that behind every regulation, grand or petty, stands the government's willing to, willingness to enforce it with force, if necessary. Expansive government has destroyed more than institutions and charities. It has undermined the moral character necessary to both civil society and to liberty under law. Professor Galston himself has written uh, eloquently about uh, the, the impossibility of a liberal society really being indifferent to the values that its citizens hold. And I agree with that. But I think there's at least an empirical question about what you do with that uh, implication. It seems clear to me, for instance, that today's private schools teach not only the three R's, but civility, respect for others, and appreciation for the American system better than public schools do. So, as in so many areas, our agreement that there is a need in society doesn't necessarily imply the advisability of government action uh, to bring it about. The bourgeois virtues of work, thrift, sobriety, prudence, fidelity, self-reliance, and a concern for one's reputation developed and endured because they're the virtues necessary for success in a world where food and shelter must be produced and where people are responsible for their own flourishing. Government can't do much to instill those virtues in people, but it can do a lot to undermine them by subsidizing people, by uh, regulating, by enforcing decisions on people. It can take away 
both the incentive and the need and the opportunity to make moral decisions for ourselves. As a moral matter, individuals ought to be free to make their own decisions and to succeed or fail according to their own choices. And as a practical matter, when we shield people from the consequences of their actions, we get a society characterized not by thrift, sobriety, diligence, self-reliance, and prudence, but by profligacy, intemperance, indolence, dependency, and indifference to the consequences of our actions. As we enter a new century and a new millennium, we are encountering a world of endless possibility. The very premise of the world of global markets and new technology is libertarianism. We know that neither a rigid conservatism nor a stultifying socialism uh, would bring about the free, technologically advanced society that we anticipate in the 21st century. If we want a dynamic world of prosperity and opportunity, if we want a world of virtue and good character, we must make it a libertarian world. The principles of the American Revolution, individual liberty, limited government, and free markets, turn out to be even more powerful in a world of instant communication and global markets than Jefferson or Madison could have imagined. Libertarianism is not just a framework for utopia, as Robert Nozick wrote. It is the indispensable framework for the future. Thank you. I managed to neglect to uh, mention uh, Charles Murray's most relevant book for today, which is uh, What It Means to Be a Libertarian, which is a great uh, comp uh, complimentary book to, uh, to David. <laughs> Ed has always uh, sort of gotten so depressed after saying the words, the bell curve, that he can't remember what comes next. <laughs> <laughs> but in eight minutes, um, uh, first place, what he said, okay, for, for a large part of uh, my own views, that David said, uh, uh, there's nothing he said I did not subscribe to. But, but let me put in eight minutes an issue I, I know that uh, Robin and Bill are interested in as well, and that, that has to do with questions of how it is that people live satisfying lives, which I think are going to be forced to the forefront in the near future in a way that they have not been in the past. And I think that the libertarian answer is going to be increasingly the one that is seen as not just the one which is economically most productive, but the one which is morally most compelling. And, and I mean it for this reason. Until now, a lot of the welfare state has been based on, the argument about the welfare state has been based on debates about whether we can afford it. We are very close to a time. I would argue we may be there already, but we certainly, within a matter of a few decades, are going to reach the time at which certain kinds of choices can be made unconstrained by financial problems, which is to say, we will be able, if we wish, to give every person above the age of 18, let's say, in this country, an income well above the poverty line. And we will be able to tolerate the work disincentives that that would entail, even very large work disincentives, because the accumulation of wealth is, is increasing so rapidly that that simply will be financially feasible. It actually is financially feasible probably already now, but we're sort of at the end. And I guess the question that that, that, that will force us to confront is, if you could tomorrow do that financially without a problem, should we do it? And should we do it in terms of the way it would affect the lives of human beings? My basic position, which many of you in this audience are familiar with, goes as follows. You don't do it that way. You must not do it that way. Because what you are trying to accomplish with social policy is to enable people to live satisfying lives, not merely to have food and shelter and clothing. And furthermore, if we have discovered anything over the last uh, 50 years of the welfare state, it is that there is an intimate link between the way we go about acquiring material resources in this life and the satisfactions that we are able to derive from. And I guess I would put as a simple kind of evocative argument, uh, for those of you who are parents in the audience, uh, what would be your reaction if a rich relative of yours said, oh, by the way, I want, I'm going to tell your children tomorrow that as of the age of 18, they can count on a guaranteed income for life. I think a lot of you would be appalled, and the reason you would be appalled is because you, are, you, you feel very emphatically how important it is for your children to learn that they must be self-reliant, that they must be responsible for their own lives, 
and that to have access to this kind of a guaranteed income, or to any other form of the welfare state you care to specify, uh, would be terribly destructive to them. And I'm arguing that is true for the population as a whole. I often characterize it this way. Most of the people in this room already live lives that are de facto free. We pay too much in taxes. Uh, we are, many of us who are engaged in businesses, are hindered by regulations, which I do not mean to trivialize. They are very important in, in undermining other sources of satisfactions in our lives. But in a whole lot of ways, we have discovered workarounds whereby we can hire the accountants we need, we can hire the lawyers we need, we can provide the services that we need in order to get around the idiocies of the government. And what has happened with social policy in the last 50 years is much more important with regard to the folks who do not have access to those kinds of resources. Community has become so trendy as a topic that I almost hesitate to talk about it. Uh, I think a lot of glib thinking has been associated with community. But the essential part of the position is correct when it says that the geographic community remains critically important to large portions of the American population, important in ways which it is often easy to lose sight of, those of us for whom our little platoons, to use Edmund Burke's phrase, are scattered all over town in the form of professional associations and clubs, or for that matter, all over the country or all over the world. It is easy to lose sight of the ways in which people who are looking for important roles to fill, folks who are at the bottom of the bell curve, whether it is in distributions of intelligence or other personal qualities, who are never going to be rich or famous, the ways that they are going to find satisfying places in the world is because they have roles as parents and as members of community which are meaningful. And what social policy has done in the last 50 years is to denude communities of the kinds of activities that give communities vitality, that engage them in what should be called, I think, the stuff of life. What I have in mind is that for communities to function, it is important that they have the action that they are the ones who are responsible for comforting the lonely, uh, taking care of the poor, uh, educating the young, doing all the things that give texture and meaning to life in that community. And, you, and, and here is I, uh, the dialogue I want to engage in. Can you have a governmental partnership in which the government says, oh, we will join with the community and have these institutions in which you folks can feel like you're playing a meaningful role, but we, the government, will also help out? And I would argue the answer to that question is no. That when you have government partnerships like that, you have a fraud. And that everybody knows it, and that they don't work. And that we can look back to the 1960s for many examples of how it doesn't work. And that if you want to achieve the goal that is so widely talked about today, of having vital communities in which people, in which people do have it, a satisfying, meaningful place. The only way to do it is to withdraw the government more completely than is contemplated by either the Republicans or the Democrats. The same kinds of remarks, I think, should be emphasized with regard to making a living. Uh, one of the quintessential ways of getting ahead in this society has always been to start a business. But a lot of what has happened in recent years has been to denude the possibilities for somebody who does not have a lot of financial backing, and again is not a genius, but who is willing to put a sweat equity into his life, de deny that person the kind of opportunity that he deserves to be able to run a small business, to have his own uh, vocation, independently of the kinds of government regulations which those of us who work for large corporations can get around because we have batteries of lawyers we have the accounting departments and the rest of it to deal with those problems, but which systematically prevent people from doing that kind of thing, which provides meaning in their lives. As I said at the beginning, trying to say all this in eight minutes is very difficult, and I'm conscious as I've done it of all the gray areas I haven't filled in. The essence of my position is that in a post-industrial society and in an extremely wealthy society, it is more important not less important, that people have genuine responsibility for their lives, and that the people who are most to be benefited by a libertarian future are not the rich guys, not the smart people, 
it is the people who at the present time are being systematically prevented by well-intentioned government programs from the doing the things that will give content to their own experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles and David. Uh, Bill Galston is a professor at the School of Public Affairs at the University of Maryland and director of the University's Institute for Philosophy and uh, Public Policy, where I'll be going in a month for an event. Uh, during the first two and a half years of the uh, Clinton administration, he served as deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy. He's also the author of uh, six books and, uh, of course, many articles in the area of political philosophy and public policy. He's also had uh, roles in the campaign of my uh, nemesis, John Anderson, and uh, worked as issues director for Walter Mondale's uh, campaign in the uh, early 80s, certainly somebody who was highly qualified to participate in this debate uh, and is also affiliated uh, with the Democratic Leadership uh, Council and the Progressive Policy Institute. Oh, oh wait, let me, let me do it the way I did the other one. And uh, the other uh, speaker is Rob Shapiro. Rob and Will Marshall have uh, done a marvelous job at the, at the Progressive Policy Institute in, in uh, creating a lively and, and very constructive uh, think tank that is trying to uh, undertake the daunting task of interjecting ideas into the Democratic Party. Uh, <laughs> no less a daunting task than Heritage trying to get ideas into the Republican Party. Uh, but Rob is a, a founder and the vice president of the Progressive uh, PPI and the director of economic uh, studies at the Progressive uh, Foundation. Uh, he served as a principal economic advisor to uh, Bill Clinton in the 92 presidential campaign and as a senior advisor to the Clinton Board uh, transition. He still acts, of course, as an advisor to the administration. Uh, before joining the Institute, uh, Rob was the Deputy National Issues Director and Senior Economic Advisor for the Dukakis Medicine uh, presidential campaign. Before that, he was an Associate Editor of the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Bill Nelson. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm grateful for this invitation, uh, not the least because it's given me the opportunity to uh, read two admirable books on uh, each member of Team A. Um, I take it that my role is not to advance my own views so much as it is to engage in a dialogue about the views put forward in these, these two books. And I will try to do that uh, within the limits of, of the eight minutes. I should, I should say that one of the things that jumps out at me is that the two members of Team A disagree on some very fundamental matters, uh, leading me to wonder exactly what libertarianism is. Let me give you three examples. Uh, Charles Murray officially and explicitly subscribes to the category of public goods and sketches conditions under which government may legitimately pursue public goods, whereas David Bowes, in his treatment of that issue, comes very close, I think, to arguing that there aren't any real public goods, that it is always possible to redesign uh, modes of production and property rights so as to rule out that category. Uh, another example, uh, Charles Murray, uh, affirms repeatedly in his book uh, the need to argue pragmatically from the consequences of individual collective actions and not just from the principles of libertarianism or any other set of principles, whereas David Bowes seems to uh, reserve arguments for consequences to emergency situations and he is much more content with argument from first principles. A third example, uh, Charles Murray, at various points in his book, is explicitly willing to countenance what he regards as reasonable trade-offs between principles of individual liberty on the one hand and the satisfaction of human needs on the other, whereas for David Bowes, that kind of trade-off is close to 
morally forbidden. So my one of my questions is, what is libertarianism? Uh, is it the Charles Murray version, or is it the David Bowes version? I think it makes a big difference. Now, one of the interesting things about these three, about these two books, is the different levels of analysis: uh, political philosophy, constitutionalism, public policy. I think it invites uh, these books invite us to commit some political philosophy, but also to engage in other levels as well. David, in his opening remarks, identified the category of choice or consent as key, and I agree. And so let me turn to uh, page 43 of his book and read a few words uh, whose uh, familiarity, I hope, has not read contempt. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these, among these, note that phrase, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Now, I think that's a tolerably good statement, clear, of liberal political philosophy. And what that tells me is, as the words themselves state, the just powers of the government are derived from the consent of the government, from which it follows that if a people, in ratifying a constitution, endows its government with the power to tax in order to pursue the purposes of that instrument, then consent in all politically meaningful senses has occurred, and it is impossible to talk about taxation as coercion. Let me put it differently, but to the same end. If there are any legitimate powers of government, and both members of Team A say that they are, unless you believe that, that government can carry out its legitimate purposes, whatever they are, without human and material resources, you must endorse the conclusion that the government that has been created has the right to mobilize the resources needed to carry out its legitimate purposes. Otherwise, the government would be a nullity. With regard to the legitimate purposes of government, We've already heard from the Declaration of Independence, I underscored the phrase, among these, to suggest that in Jefferson's mind, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are not the totality of the rights that we have. And the document itself invites us to consider what rights we have. I would also point out that the preamble to the Constitution, which is a document that enjoys the legitimacy contemplated in the Declaration independence, the first government in human history to come into existence through the consent of the people. The preamble to that constitution states the point of the document in expansive terms, terms that include the phrase, the general welfare. The American people consented then and consent today to a constitution which in legitimate ways pursues the general welfare. And how much more time do I have? Two minutes. Let me take up then just one other issue, which I think bulks very large in the libertarian analysis, and that is the issue of spontaneous order. Resonant phrase, and I think pivotal to the expectation that voluntary cooperation can substitute for all or nearly all forms of coercion. I'd like to read another few familiar words. This from Federalist 51, where James Madison writes, what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. The Constitution that we have reflects the understanding that virtue including the virtue of spontaneous cooperation, is in short supply. And because it is in short supply, government is necessary. That's not the only reason that government is necessary, 
but it is one of the reasons. We need authoritative rules as the framework within which free and spontaneous decisions can be made. And in some cases, we need authoritative rules to deal with the free rider problem. That is to say that people will embrace a certain set of means as desirable, but hope that they themselves will not have to pay the price of furthering those means through an individual contribution. And here, in conclusion, let me, let me grasp the metal firmly, uh, because David, David Bowes has identified the draft, the military draft, as one of the key dividing lines between libertarians and others. And I would say two things. First of all, the question of whether the draft is legitimate is in part a question of whether the people as a whole have consented to a government that has as one of its powers in order to promote the common defense, the institution of a draft. And I think it's pretty clear that the answer to that question is yes. But with regard to the question of spontaneous order, here's what David Bowes has to say. The libertarian believes that people will voluntarily defend a country worth defending. He is much more of an optimist than I am. I believe that there are many human beings who think, many citizens of the United States who think that the United States government is eminently worth defending, but have given half a chance, would shirk their duty to contribute to the common defense. And that is why we need a government that has the power to do what libertarians would de deny the power to do. Thank you very much. Marks, I feel a little redundant, but let me say first uh, how pleased I am to be here today. I want to salute Ed Crane and Cato for sponsoring a debate on such a serious question, and I want to say right off that David Boaz and Charles Murray have published works that really offer very challenging briefs for their point of view. Um, now let me say I reject that brief. Um, <laughs> ultimately, I cannot find a logical demonstration in the argument. And the argument, to me, seems to rest on assumptions that I find problematic at best. Still, I admire their ambition. They set out not simply to argue that minimalist government is efficient or fair, but to demonstrate logically that it is required by the nature of man and of society. But this effort, is so great, falls, I believe, on its first principle, which is the idea of natural right. The basic claim is that whatever people can do, it is their right to do by nature, so long as it doesn't injure anyone else. And since this is a right by nature, it precedes government and society, and therefore, which therefore have no standing to alter it. Now, natural right is an old idea derived by some philosophers from underlying concepts of the character of God or of reason. But David and Charles don't do that. Instead, David claims that his intuition tells him that his rights rest on the natural order. Charles doesn't use the word intuition, but his sense of it is the same. Intuition doesn't demonstrate anything. It's an assertion confirmed by feeling. My intuition is different. Now my feelings need concern no one but myself. Uh, but with all respect, the logic of libertarianism cannot rest on David and Charles' feelings. Um, nor does it matter to the logic of the case that Thomas Jefferson also considered natural rights to be self-evident, something to do by intuition. In fact, I, f I find my friends' recurring appeals to the authority of Jefferson and the other founders <coughs> were peculiar, since Jefferson and the founders also thought it was perfectly proper to take lives and property by force in order to assert those rights. They did, after all, lead a violent revolution. Much of the argument of these works, however, rests on the, a particular natural right, and that is the right to property. Uh, yet, this right is also uh, asserted as self-evident. Uh, now, in one respect, I share this view. The right to your own mind and body does seem prior to anything else, because without it, individuality itself seems impossible. But the same cannot be said of property outside your body and your mind. Now, this is a question that John Locke gave a lot of thought to, and I gratefully accept his guidance. Uh, based on his analysis of personality in the essay on human understanding, Locke does accord some property, some intrinsic or natural status, 
because we come to know both our own capacities and the character of the physical world when we create, by our own efforts, something out of nature. Now we come to know what we can do and the characteristics of the world around us so that the act of creating property has natural status because it is the way we form our individuality. But for Locke, the natural right here is to create property, not necessarily to retain it. That right is related to society because it depends on the rise of a money system and a broader commerce, and because it is useful both for the division of labor and to reduce problems of scarcity. According to Locke's logic, the right to retain property outside your own body and mind is not natural at all. It exists, but it is, but it is social and political. Now, in a certain sense, David and Charles implicitly, I think, acknowledge the political status of the right to retain property at least in the form their arguments take. Because instead of establishing a right to retain property a priority, they instead refer to hypothetical consequences, um, something that Bill noted as well. What might happen if there were no property rights? But if the proper character and extent of property rights depends on whatever produces the, the best result, how do we judge that? If everyone knows his or her own interest, one answer is to ask everyone and use law to generalize the conditions for achieving whatever the best results are. In short, in the absence of an a priori demonstration of the natural right to retain property, the definition of property rights becomes a subject for the democracy, which can legitimately address it because it is based on consent, as Bill noted. The logic here is clearly not libertarian. Rather, for both Locke and me, and Bill, and I think the founders, Government based on consent does not by nature limit freedom, but rather can create the conditions for the development of individuality in a world where many individuals have to share a common physical space. So, Ed, it's not necessarily the case that the only two ways of organizing society are coercively through government or voluntarily through private association, something I know that you say from David's book. Uh, there's a third way based on consent. Now, David at least does acknowledge that democracy presents a problem for libertarianism when he argues that democracy and liberty are not the same. From that point on, however, both he and Charles are generally silent on the subject of democracy, perhaps because in a certain sense their argument is an attempt to make a case for liberty without democracy, that is, without common consent. But we cannot get rid of consent to government entirely because people need certain public goods, such as law enforcement, national defense, and who would have thought it pollution control, uh, according to Charles. Still, we cannot logically, still they, cannot logically concede that democracy, with all its connotations of collectivity, can impose a desirable rule of law to provide for these goods. So they posit an alternative. Again, a point that both Bill and I noticed, Social order and the rule of law arise not through a political process, but spontaneously. Or as Charles puts it, libertarianism makes one simple claim, deprived of the use of force, human beings tend to cooperate. But what do these claims mean, and what is their conceivable basis? I think we're back to intuition. In any case, it's worth remembering that Locke and Hobbes both thought that disorder and lawlessness were just as natural as order and cooperation, and perhaps more so. Then there's the sticky problem of just where our extensive government came from. If American life and society were as satisfying before extended government, as Charles suggests, then why did Americans ever choose bigger government? In particular, why did government grow as the franchise was extended? Now, maybe the generations of Americans who used the democratic process to extend government just didn't know their own best interests. Or perhaps elites foisted big government on everyone else and have somehow managed to maintain it for generations. If so, then either democracy has been a conspiracy and a fraud, as the militias now claim, or generations of Americans have suffered from false consciousness, as the Marxists used to say. A third alternative is that the libertarian embrace of radical individuality is simply a choice by some people, while other cho others choose otherwise namely for the security of collectivity. It's not enough to, to object that the collectivity of others, say the social security system, that's the kind of collectivity I'm referring to, should not be binding on you, David and Charles, 
because you feel it threatens your individuality. It could be said with equal, equal force that your assertion of individuality threatens their choice as well. There is another point I find puzzling. David praises the Constitution for reserving rights not explicitly delegated to the federal government, to the states and the people. Charles makes much the same point in his notion of subsidiarity, which says that legitimate functions of government should be performed at the most local level possible. Why? If the issue is government's power, in principle, what difference does it make if this force is exerted at a local or national level? Presumably, this is another argument from results rather than principle, namely that local governments are observed to use less force or to use it less often. But if results are the measure, the case for local government is subject to empirical argument and government can properly be conducted at whatever level is considered most likely to produce the most efficient results with a minimum of force, and that may be a national level, it may be a global level. Finally, permit me a few points as an economist. If taxes and regulation caused the slump in productivity of the last 20 years, then why did it appear so suddenly? Why did it occur across the world? If the size of government were the reason for the slow growth of the last generation, then why did growth accelerate in the preceding generation when the size of government was also expanding, indeed was expanding at a much faster rate? Why did, it, why did growth continue to slow in the last two decades as government size stabilized? The fact is the United States became rich in an era of fairly extensive government, which after all did not begin in 1964. In the end, David and Charles, I respect your faith. I don't share your, inter your, your intuition. Despite your efforts, both logic and history, as well as sentiment, point me in a different direction. Or let's say that in the spirit of order and cooperation and the tradition of libertarianism, I choose a different view. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rob and Bill, for your comments. Now we will have three-minute rejoinders, beginning with David Bowie. Um, I appreciate those very careful readings of uh, both our books, and three minutes is hardly time to respond. I will note to begin that uh, both Bill and Rob criticized the, the moral foundations, the philosophical foundations of libertarianism, um, which was perfectly appropriate given the way the books were written. I'm not sure they actually answered the question, should we welcome a libertarian future, which one could conclude the answer was yes uh, on uh, more or less consequentialist utilitarian grounds. However, uh, I think we can guess that they would say no, uh, and the fact is that, that, that we are making a moral case here, and so uh, this line of argument is certainly sensible. Um, let me take a, uh, a crack at this question of, by ratifying the Constitution, did we consent to everything the U.S. government has done since? I think that's sort of the crux of Bill Galston's uh, disagreement with this brand of liberalism. Um, yes, we, the government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. Bill did not emphasize the word just, and I think that's an uh, uh, important part of that phrase. The powers come from the consent of the governed, but they must still be just powers. And I think the just powers are those stated in the previous sentence, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That is the purpose of government, to secure rights. Uh, the rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, yes, it says among these, uh, and I would make the case that we have an infinite number of rights. I could stand here all night enumerating rights that we have. What we usually do is enumerate rights each time the government threatens one of them. We, we don't try to write them all down in advance. Um, and that indeed was what the original Constitution did. The Constitution began with the premise that the people have rights. They may delegate some of them to the government. In the Constitution, they enumerated the powers they were giving the government. And they couldn't give the government any powers they didn't already have. I don't have the power to take your wallet for my purposes. Therefore, I don't think I can delegate to government the power to take your wallet for my purposes. I can only delegate powers that I would be allowed to exercise myself, but to secure rights more effectively, we create a government. So I think we have not consented to everything the government has chosen to do since then. I read the Constitution as consenting to 
delegated, enumerated, and thus limited powers, the power specifically to secure rights. Now, I acknowledge that just to secure rights, we do need some government. And if that government requires a national defense in particular, it, it may cost some money. And we do, uh, therefore, have to, have to grant the government some powers. I don't think that means that we, therefore, have consented to anything Congress does from then on out. And I think uh, that's a key distinction here. Um, we're also asked, why did the government grow throughout the 200 years? And of course, in some ways, it didn't. By ending slavery, it, in effect, reduced substantially the amount of coercion in society. Uh, but government grows not always through a majority of the people saying, OK, we now consent to more things. It also grows through rent seeking through minorities, even tiny minorities of people uh, managing to manipulate the political process. And that is what the Constitution was supposed to forestall. I believe that's what general welfare meant. It was stating that the purpose of government will be to serve the general welfare, not the particular welfare. Farm subsidies, Chrysler bailouts, um, building, uh, building mass transit systems in the chairman's district, those things serve the particular welfare, not the general welfare. And that's what the limited powers of the Constitution were supposed to forestall. One last point, um, I am asked, why, why do you prefer state governments to federal governments? Should your principles apply in both places? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. But there is something more than a consequentialist argument. There is an argument from the principle going on that competition is better than monopoly. And competition among 50 states is better than a monopoly federal government. Competition among 3,000 local governments is even better. Competition among 6 million private businesses is even better. But 50 is better in, than one. And I think there is a principal basis, therefore, for devolution of power. Is this on? I just want to say, uh, David went four minutes. Everyone did such a good job on their actual speeches that were in, uh, uh, in good shape time-wise, so why don't we give four minutes to everybody? Great. Uh, I not only want to express my uh, gratification at uh, the way that our books were read uh, by both uh, uh, our Team B. In my case, it's virtually unique to have someone uh, read <laughs> before they uh, uh, talk about the <laughs> Let me point out one thing, however, that neither of the speakers did address. Uh, both David and I are making a very ambitious claim they did not talk about. We are saying that human beings are hardwired, if you will, to require responsibility for their lives in order to live satisfying lives. And that freedom is not only a natural right, it is fundamentally important to making good on this deep-seated requirement. So th that's an issue that I'd be interested to hear the response to, and I think it's central understanding why David and I uh, feel so strongly about uh, the need for a libertarian state and why we should welcome a libertarian state in the future. Let me uh, take my one crack at uh, the spontaneous order issue and the quotation from Federalist 51 about if men were angels, we would not need government. David and I are not anarchists. And we want to provide in government that which James Madison, who, if I remember correctly, wrote 51, uh, also wanted, which is to say you've got to have government to prevent people from hitting each other over the head. You have to have government to prevent each other people from using coercion and fraud, which indeed they will use because they are not angels. However, to say that we want to we think that spontaneous order will work is not really such an intuitive statement. On the contrary, I think it has a deep and extremely persuasive empirical backdrop. Let me put it in the form of a challenge. Name for me in American history an occasion when there was over an extended period of time oppression of any group of people that did not involve either the licit or illicit use of force or the threat of force. And I will say, in preface to the remarks they might make, and why is it that at Cato, they get the last word uh, on all these things? <laughs> Home court advantage to me. Um, uh, you know, if, you, if you want to think about economic coercion in the 19th century and bosses exploiting their workers and so on, so forth, I argue that in that kind of case, in, in every instance, there was the use of goons or the threat of the use of goons to enforce that kind of exploitation. 
If you want to talk about what happened with blacks following the Civil War, let alone before the Civil War, but following the Civil War, you did not have a situation in which people were using purely non-violent non means. You always had the use of the police, illicit or illicit, to enforce social norms. I would say that empirically, libertarians have a great argument to make for the proposition that deprived of the use of force, human beings have a real good track record. We do get along, and here's the reason, as, as, as uh, discussed beautifully by Adam Smith. Human beings are not angels, but they do have a deep, instinctive desire for the approbation of their fellow human beings. If you have a society in which it is permitted to get approbation for being the strongest and the most, ruth most ruthless who can uh, use physical force to dominate other people, that people are oftentimes delighted to get that kind of approbation. When that kind of approbation is withheld from them by the rule of law, which David and I are both strongly in favor of, the only way you get approbation is by behaving in ways which elicit approbation for ways in which you are cooperative. It's not magic. It's, it's very consistent with human nature. Uh, in this regard, also, I would just make another parenthetical statement, uh, the kind of thing that neither Team A nor Team B can document at any length of this period which is that not only do we have a good track record when it comes to uh, being deprived of the use of force, I would say that on almost any measure of success of government policy that is used by government activists, whether it is safety or health or civil rights or poverty, you name it, that if you take a look at what was happening in this country before the government started to intervene and what happened after the government started to intervene, you do not suddenly see those trend lines turning in a positive direction after the government got involved. It is crucial to understand that I am not trying to evoke an ideal United States of the past in which everything was just fine, and I don't think David is either. We are, however, making another empirical claim that on all important indicators of social progress, the United States was moving in the right direction extremely rapidly before government intervention. And not only has government intervention in the vast majority of cases failed to accelerate that progress, in many cases it has impeded it. Thank you. Well, let me try to address four issues very quickly. Uh, first of all, it was not my argument that throughout American history, everything that the government of the United States has done is within the four corners of the Constitution. That would be absurd, certainly not mine. My point is only that through the process of popular consent to a government as contemplated in the Declaration of Independence, that certain powers are explicitly granted by the people to the national government. And you know, if you look at uh, you know, if you look at the Constitution, it very clearly says that Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. And so my point is only that if the people have consented to a Constitution which has that as one of its enumerated powers, that taxation for those purposes and to that extent is not coercion, let alone theft. And if that point is granted, then I don't care about the details. With regard to the issue of personal responsibility, uh, Team B couldn't agree more. And that is, that is why the Progressive Policy Institute and the Democratic Leadership Council <coughs> have been on the forefront for 10 years of an effort, as the 1992 phrase put it, to end welfare as we now know it, and to turn the welfare system into a work system. So the disagreement there is not on the level of principle. We freely acknowledge that being handed something is typically much less constructive than going out and making it for oneself. That is not the issue. The question is, Within that moral frame, what is a legitimate, productive role for government? I note with interest that my friend Charles Murray is in favor of a $3,000 education voucher for each and every one of the roughly 15 million <coughs> school children 
uh, in America today, which his math and mine uh, tell me is a $150 billion government program, uh, only 3% of which now exists. So the issue, you know, the issue is not personal responsibility per se. The issue is the role of government in either promoting it or hindering it. That is an empirical question and not a categorical question. With regard to the issue of spontaneous order, my point is only that you need an enforceable framework of rules in order to have an arena within which the drama of spontaneous order can be enacted. And the question of which rules you need and how detailed they are depends on the facts of the case. David, in his book, gives a wonderful description of the San Francisco airport and air traffic control versus the millions of individual decisions that automobile drivers uh, make and carry out every day. Fine. But I hope he's not suggesting that the air tra traffic of this country should be conducted on the same terms and principles as automobile traffic. That would be absurd. We need one structure of rules for that, for one kind of activity, namely air travel, and a very different looser structure of rules for another activity, namely automobile, automobile travel. And so the question, the question in each case is what the facts of the case require. An empirical question, not a categorical question. I will eschew the fourth point. Well, let me just continue my, my friend Bill's last comment, uh, because it is a very instructive comparison, the air traffic control system and the system of traffic control. Um, it is a decentralized system, that is, that is automobile traffic, but it is one that rests firmly both on the exercise of public resources and the expression of law. Um, that is, we stop at stop signs, we stop at red lights, we construct the red lights, we construct the roads, we know the law, we, we not only know the laws, but by knowing the laws, we have an expectation of that other drivers know the laws. And so consequently, it seems to me that the entire structure of this, of what is presented as a generally free system, that is uh, the way we conduct ourselves in automobiles, rests upon um, a uh, common enterprise that is put in place through uh, the common effort of government. Um, David, of course we do not delegate the right, the, the right to take someone else's wallet to government because we don't have that right, but we do delegate the right to take something out of our own wallet to government, um, as Bill has pointed out. Um, we agree that people in government can sometimes be corrupt and stupid and, and make bad decisions or corrupt decisions, as in corporate welfare. They can in government as they can in, it, in any enterprise, even in think tanks. People make mistakes. Um, uh, but that's what elections are about uh, in politics. Um, you don't have to abolish government um, to try to rid yourself of the potential of error in government. Uh, you, have to, you have to abolish those people in government who make the, mis who make the mistakes or are corrupt. Um, uh, third, um, of course, we are mainly capable of responsibility, Charles. We are even capable of virtue. Um, if not, there would be no civilization. Um, certainly, we do not hold that government is necessary because all of our, imp all of our imp impulses are uh, nasty and brutish. Um, but the fact is that government is there when virtue and responsibility fail. Um, and also where circumstance fails in a catastrophic way. Um, and the community makes the decision that uh, they choose not to tolerate a catastrophic failure for a child or an old person, for example. Um, and finally, um, examples of sustained private violence against the rights of others without the government. Was that that's, the, that's the threat of yes. of course. Yes. Uh, that is uh, absent the threat or use of public force. No. I mean, so, a, so, so, the, so the question is, can you give me an example of some time when, uh, when Well, the fact that... Of time, 
terms. The fact that virtually no women for generations could enter any of the professions, for example, was, a violence, against, was violence against their rights, was not carried out by government, was carried out by private associations. Um, uh, Anti-Semitism uh, in the United States was not sanctioned by law um, or enforced by law. I think, in, yeah, unfortunately, there are examples. And, in, and it meant, in some cases, um, cases of, of violence against groups, against the rights of, of groups or individuals are, are addressed through private associations. Sometimes they're addressed through government. Most often they're addressed by both. Because as the society comes to agree that that kind of violence is no longer tolerable, um, they turn to government to reinforce the change that um, uh, private associations are undertaking. questions um, from the panelists, I'd ask uh, Bill, uh, <clears throat> Bill to be the first uh, questioner. You can direct it to one or both of the uh, other people from where you are. Well, I'll, I'll address my question to, uh, to, to David, but it may bring Charles and Bray uh, as well. Uh, in his book, David argues against uh, the pursuit of equality of opportunity on the grounds that any effort to realize it completely would mean an intolerable intrusion into the family. Uh, I think he's absolutely right about that. Uh, and I would like him, first of all, to explain why it is that the pursuit, if it is the case of the pursuit of full equality of opportunity would have those consequences, why it follows from that fact that the pursuit of equality of opportunity as one among a number of plural goods to be pursued up to the point of reason and no farther follows from the defects of, of, uh, you know, of the full pursuit. And in that connection, uh, I would like him to comment, not as a matter of practice, but as a matter of principle, on Charles's proposal for a $3,000 per child education voucher which would have as one of its principal consequences the equalization of opportunity. Okay. Um, that is a good question in the sense it gets at the heart of one of the arguments that I tried to make in my book, uh, which is we have a pretty good society. We are generally free. We are generally prosperous. Um, why do we need this relatively radical um, argument? And, and, and the point I was trying uh, to make throughout, I think, is that, yes, we have a good deal of freedom and a good deal of prosperity. We could have a good deal more. We ought to morally, and as a practical matter, we could be uh, much better off. And without some anchor, some principle to bind us, to, to tell us these are the roles of government and, and that's what it will be limited to, I think we end up, inevitably, um, at least at a government, that takes uh, two and a half trillion dollars a year from what we've earned, if you include federal, state, and local governments, and prescribes the number and gender ratio of uh, toilets in buildings open to the public. Um, without principles to keep us uh, to the rules we have established, uh, we, we, we will end up with this sort of unlimited, out of control government. So my point about equality of opportunity was if you truly want to create equal opportunity for every child in America, you first got the problem that natural endowments differ. If you say, we'll live with the natural endowments, then you've got the problem that family environments differ. Now, I read a book not too long ago that argued for, because of that, taking children away from their families and uh, raising them essentially in kibbutzes, and then at the age of 18, hey, you're on your own. Um, many of you, of course, have read the short story by Har uh, uh, Harrison Bergeron uh, that talks about actually scarring the beautiful and impeding the brain processes of the smart in order to create true equality. That's something I presume no one actually favors. The question is, if you decide that you really cannot create this full equality of opportunity, then why not establish equal rights as the point that government should enforce and leave it at that level? Otherwise, you're into this wide-ranging thing. As for my good friend Charles Murray's proposal, for a $3,000 federal voucher for every child in America. Um, 
he couldn't have been serious. <laughs> I, I, I think there were a couple of issues there. <laughs> clearly, clearly, if the government is going to pay for education, some form of competitive provision makes more sense than the monopoly systems we've got now. And so if the question were, what about a voucher at the state or local level, then I would say it's better than what we've got, but it's not as good as full educational freedom. Um, I think Charles didn't want to get into the issue of arguing between the federal and the state role, and so he said federal. Um, I, would, I would oppose that. I would say keep it at the state and local level. But I would also view it as a pragmatic issue. In theory, in principle, um, I would prefer a system of full educational freedom where one of the responsibilities of being a parent is paying for the education of your child or of soliciting private support for that education. I'm persuaded. I just no, I don't. Um, let me just pose a question, and then either or both can take it on um, to try to get at sort of the essence of the libertarian position that somebody who's making an honest living and minding his own business should be able to do what he wants to, and groups of people should be able to do the same. Uh, let me pose the, the question this way. If two people want to reach an agreement about a job of work, and I want to hire a guy to do some work, and I specify, here's how much I'm willing to pay, and here are the conditions of work I'm willing to do, and if the other guy is willing to say yes to that, what business of the government's is it to impede that transaction in any way, shape, or form whatsoever? And I'm going to going to make the question, I hope, a little tougher than that, because if you if you are going to say, oh, well, if you talk about large corporations, and then you've got the imbalance of bargaining power, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and there I'm going to sort of stipulate, I agree, that poses special problems. But when you get down to uh, a much smaller scale of small businesses, <coughs> people employing a few people, why on earth does the government have any business saying to citizens of the United States, you shall not come to mutual agreements of this sort? Well, indeed, I think that in most cases they don't have. The only ground for uh, uh, dictating some terms of the agreement or some terms of the, of the exchange. Um, um, uh, well, excuse me, I just, because I don't want to get uh, sidetracked on an issue of, aren't I right in saying that, that the uh, for terms of employment Condition of employment and pay employment are tightly circumscribed in all sorts of ways? Well, now, if we, yes, they, well, I wouldn't say tightly circumscribed. I would say <laughs> <laughs> we have a minimum wage, for example. You, we have a minimum wage, which is cited by both of you as a, as a painful constraint on economic freedom. Um, well, um, about 97% of Americans are, are affected in no way by the minimum wage, that is their wages are significantly higher. Um, so no one is forcing businesses to pay them more than businesses think uh, uh, they're worth. I frankly, as an economist, cannot understand how, um, a, a, how the minimum wage can ever force a business to pay a worker more than the business can, than the value which the worker can provide to the business. Um, and. That is, that is, a minimum wage does not force you to hire anyone. It says that if you hire someone, you have to pay him a certain amount, a, a certain minimum. Um, so in fact, I don't agree that uh, the terms of employment are tightly constrained. I think there are cases in which there are uh, unnecessary regulation and cases in which the regulation is perfectly sound. One of the reasons that regulation is sound, for example, of uh, um, work, workplace conditions, which is, which is an issue that both of you address. Um, one could say that there should be no restriction on um, uh, no safety requirements in the way you conduct your business, because after all, anyone, any worker has the right to not work in, for a business which is not safe. Um, that would require perfect knowledge. Uh, one of the roles of government, in fact, in economic life um, is to um, in effect, try to offset both either information costs or more often uh, information deficits, which people have, um, by establishing minimums which transmit that information. 
And so the individual, it would be very inefficient for the individual to have the individual worker to have to make a safety survey of every workplace um, before deciding to work there. And so the government reduces those information costs through a general regulation. That's very efficient, Charles. Bill, you have a comment, and then Rob, your question. Yes, I'm, I'm delighted that Charles asked that question because it gives me an opportunity to, you know, to get him perhaps to comment on one of the examples that he put forward, uh, you know, as an example of government either being useless or worse than useless. I refer to OSHA. Uh, and Charles points out quite accurately uh, that in the 20 years before OSHA uh, is, uh, was established, the rate of deaths on the job declined from 27 per 100,000 to 17 per 100,000. I think, I, I think that's uh, that, about it. And in the 20 years after OSHA, the decline was from 17 per 100,000 to 8 per 100,000. I think I have the, I think I have the new, the, uh, the do not make a reference. Okay, now, I would, you know, I would start with the observation, which I think is a pretty general principle of social policy, that later increments of reduction in harm and promotion of good are harder to accomplish than earlier increments. That, you know, that the early increments are generally cheap and easy. And the you know, farther along you go, the more difficult it is typically to get additional increments of good to, to work on additional increments, increments of the harm. And by your own figures, in the 20 years before OSHA, deaths on the job declined by 37%. And in the 20 years afterwards, they declined by 51%, suggesting that you know, if nature had taken its course, the rate of decline would have slowed down because it gets harder. But in fact, it accelerated significantly. And so I could do a calculation of the number of lives saved over those 20 years because of the difference between 37% and 51 37% and 51%. And that suggests to me that the example, one of the examples that you put on the table of useless or worse than useless government, uh, government intervention, is an example of exactly the reverse. And I would add only one other thing. It seems to me that the argument for preemptive public action is particularly strong when the harm that would otherwise be inflicted is irreversible and uncompensable. And death on the job is a very good example. We don't want to get into a five-minute argument specifically about OSHA, so I'll, I'll try to frame the, the comments as generally as possible. One, one is that whereas I concede the general uh, principle about to the last 10% is harder to fix than the uh, first 90%, that insofar as you have had a dramatic change in the nature of work in this country away from the kinds of industrial workplaces which were the most dangerous toward service industries and other things, you had, going for OSHA, a natural change in the way that work was being done, which made it easier for them to produce results. But in fact, the way I think I put that in the book uh, was, was fairly modest. Uh, I was saying, you know, this actually is one of those cases in which I'm not trying to say government was counterproductive, as I think it very often is, but rather in something which has had an enormous intrusive effect on the way people run their businesses, uh, as well as enormous expense you really have to go, you, you have to get down in the nitty gritty and look at those coefficients real hard and control for lots of variables to try to make a case that OSHA actually has done a lot of good. And that more generally, and this is a, a broader theme, and I think one where libertarians, by the way, both have a good empirical case but have not done as good a job of that empirical case as they should, of saying, look, let's take a very hard look at what we can see as the positive added value of government interventions uh, because of my confidence that it's going to be real hard to find them. I have contemplated the possibility of doing a book, uh, Phil, which would consist of just lots and lots of trend lines of this sort. And what I would do at the outset of that is send along a letter to you and to Rob and to the Center of Budget and Policy Priorities, and to Ralph Nader and everyone else, and say to them, folks, this is the book I'm writing. And if you will provide me with trend lines that you think support your case for 
positive government effects, I not only will say I might put them in the book, I absolutely guarantee to put them in the book, assuming they meet basic standards of quality of data and so forth and so on. Because it is my view that there is a case out there to be made which says, boy, this emperor is not completely naked. And maybe with OSHA, you've got some jockey shorts for him. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but boy, is there not much out there. And that the question is not, can we afford to get along without the good things that government has provided for us <coughs> if we get rid of government in the ways that David and I would like to do, but that in the huge majority of cases, there is nothing to get along without. Um, I'm going to ask two short questions, please, and reasonably short answers, um, because the audience has been very patient. I'm going to expand, uh, extend the, uh, the program to a quarter of six, which gives us 22 more minutes. Well, my first question is, Charles, if I send you trend lines, do I share in your advance of royalties? <laughs> Proportionately. <laughs> uh, a lot of trend lines. <laughs> I generate a lot of trend lines. Um, <laughs> I'm an economist. The, uh, uh, the issue of regulation, of course, is not the issue of stupid and petty regulation. Um, how many bathrooms uh, for each gender there have to be on each floor of a building? Um, that's at least not the issue that your works address. Your works address the um, project of the fundamental project of, go of government regulation. Uh, not whether stupid regulation should exist, but whether areas of life should be regulated at all. Uh, now, the alternative that that both of you offer is um, uh, recognizing that life involves risk. Is that a civil process? will supplant most regulations that if you are injured, um, sue. Um, um, I, would, um, uh, I, I would like a description of your thinking as to why um, a change which would proliferate the civil suit process in this country would be um, uh, progress either as a matter of efficiency or as a matter of human civilization and spontaneous order. <laughs> Rob, it, the first statement is that as the liability law has evolved in this country since the late 1950s, it has become a nightmare. And uh, if you say to me that if we continue the same ways in which we have perverted the concepts of liability and negligence out of all recognizable shape, and, uh, uh, and you don't want to have a lot more of that kind of litigation, I agree with you. Emphatically. Uh, I would argue that uh, given the kind of tort system that we had up until the late 1950s, which was imperfect but pretty good, that in fact you are not looking at millions of suits that have to be filed because you have all of these people who are being damaged and the only way they can go out and get recompense for it is by suing. That when you have a sensible uh, tort system which does hold manufacturers or service providers uh, uh, liable if they at harm that the threat of a suit is a very powerful shaper of action uh, and that it does in fact deter this great bulk of the events that you want to prevent either through regulation or through a civil <coughs> suit. So I'm saying if you got rid of regulation you and you also reformed the uh, tort system, you, you aren't looking at an explosion of litigation. Uh, there is no reason why the tort system has to be uh, the kind of monster that we've seen it become. Well, I agree with that, but I have to admit that uh, our defense of the tort system is not the strongest element uh, of, our, <laughs> of our argument. I, I do think one of the points is that very many regulations do not actually prevent harm to anyone, and therefore there wouldn't be any reason for a suit uh, in the absence of that regulation. However, we have learned that plenty of things that don't harm people do lead to lawsuits. Um, to the extent that we are Balancing one system or another, um, I would point out, as I said to Bill Maher on Politically Incorrect the other night, um, take a look recently at the case of the tainted strawberries that went to the schools. Um, the private company is going to be sued probably for all the money that it has. Is anybody suing the Department of Agriculture? Is Dan Glickman going to resign because he let tainted strawberries go to a school? Is even one little inspector in the USDA going to resign? No. That's the difference between failure in the public sector and failure in the private sector. And I think on balance, given that life is full of trade-offs, um, it works better. Now let me build on 
the issue, the, the thing that uh, Rob said there, we're not talking about just the stupid regulations. Well, but the problem is this government we've got gives us lots of stupid regulations. So I want to ask Bill, is there or should there be a rule, if you, if you don't want the rule of individuals have rights and government can only protect those rights, if you believe that we have consented to the Constitution and that allows the, con the government to do anything that is for the general welfare, is there or should there be a rule, moral or legal, um, other than the good sense of Congress and periodic elections that would tell us what government could be allowed to do? Absolutely. Uh, it is not my position. It was the position of some in the 1930s in the Roosevelt administration that the general welfare clause was the only clause worth regarding the Constitution. That is emphatically not my position. Uh, there, are, there are limits to institutional powers, uh, and those limits ought to be respected, indeed more strictly respected than they, than they now are. Uh, there are also, there are also uh, individual rights that are spelled out in the Bill of Rights. They're subject, of course, to legal interpretation. But those function, you know, Robert Nozick's term, as side constraints on, you know, on action governed by the general welfare that the government might otherwise like to perform. There may be various goods that could be accomplished, for example, if the Fifth Amendment were ignored, but the federal government does not have the power and should not be granted the power to ignore, to, to ignore the Fifth Amendment. Uh, so I have, I have no difficulty with the proposition that a government that may, as one of its legitimate purposes, pursue the general welfare is limited in the ways that it may legitimately uh, pursue it. And let me add one other thing. Um, and here may be a point of agreement. Uh, I think that we have gotten into, you know, into great difficulties because the style of legislation has changed so dramatically in the past two generations. Uh, I think it is a mistake. It is a mistake constitutionally, a mistake pragmatically, for Congress to pass excessively general laws and then hand off to agencies of the executive branch a substantial portion of what ought to be the law of making power. And to the extent that the regulations proliferate and become unwise, particularly at the margins, I think it has to do, it flows from this strategy of delegation, and along with Ted Lowy and a number of other people, I think a return to an older understanding of the legislative branch as actually passing the laws and the executive branch to a first point to a first approximation as implementing them would be a step towards common sense. Well, you're